Hey freaks, it's JJ. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, uh, here on my channel I talk about rock and metal music. I am a metalhead as well as an author. Um, side note, my debut dark fantasy novel is coming out this November. Just putting that out there. Um, anyway, today as promised we'll be going back into the Aryan universe covering their 2013 album The Theory of Everything. So this is a long uh, kind of two-part album. So uh, the way I bought it on iTunes, um, it only has four tracks on it. Um, but I think if you buy different versions of it, it has it broken down into like specific tracks. I think there's some 40 odd tracks total um, or sections if you want to call them in this full album. So it's definitely long. So this video might be a little bit longer. Uh, but yeah, I love, love, love this album so much, probably because it has one of my favorite vocalists in it, uh, Tommy Karavik of Camelot. And yeah, I just, you know, the second you hear his voice, it's just, it's beautiful. And I seriously need to cover some Camelot albums on this channel here pretty soon. Um, anyway, getting off topic. Another vocalist that they have on this album is Christina Scabia of Lacuna Coil. Um, her voice is beautiful as well. But uh, yeah, again, all-star cast, again, um, fantastic album. But before we dive into it, make sure you hit subscribe. If you haven't already, I also invite you to join my Metalhead community. From there, you'll get access to bonus content and you'll be able to request further videos that you want me to do in the future. This video actually comes as a request from my Metalhead community. So shout out to whoever requested this. They didn't leave their name. So um, yes, this video is for you. Anyway, let's get started. I was going for like an elfish, like cool, like Vikingish look, but I think I missed the mark quite a bit on my hair today. Doesn't help that the humidity just makes things go poof. So again, this uh, concept album is kind of divided into four different parts. Um, we start with phase one, singularity. And track one or part one um, of this section, we have prologue, the blackboard. So here we meet our protagonist. He is called the Prodigy, who is voiced by Tommy Kervik of uh, Camelot. And we find him in his lighthouse. And so uh, this protagonist, this Prodigy, he is just kind of lying there slumped over, completely unresponsive and in sort of like a trance. Um, and so we meet a couple of the other characters in this concept. We meet the teacher and the girl, and they kind of hover over the Prodigy and are kind of trying to figure out what is wrong with him and what happened. And so the girl and the teacher kind of survey the room looking for clues as to what might have happened to this prodigy. Um, they find a blackboard on the wall full of all these complicated um, math equations um, and crumpled in the prodigy's hand is a note. So that's just kind of like our, our opening scene. We now go back in time to see everything that led up to this point in time. So that takes us to track two, The Theory of Everything, part one. So here, this is 11 years before the events of The Lighthouse. And here we introduce another character of the father. He's obsessively working on this equation called The Theory of Everything. And this equation will unite the forces of the universe. However, as he works away, this obsession kind of forces him to neglect both his wife and his very antisocial son. Um, and his wife, AKA the mother, who is voiced by Christina Scabia, um, begs for the father to return his attention to his family. However, the father, you know, feels like he is so very close to a breakthrough with this theory of everything um, that he must find the answer and he must forge on and kind of leave his family on the back burner for just a little while longer. Uh, that takes us to track three, patterns, and this is just an instrumental section. I think this is meant to kind of imply that the father is working away on the equation. Next up, track four, The Prodigy's World. So here we are introduced a little bit more to the prodigy and his background. Um, so the prodigy uh, kind of sees all these like mathematical equations, like things that normal people couldn't even begin to understand. So I am, it's very much like Russell Crowe's character in A Beautiful Mind. Um, he just sees things differently and he's very, very smart. But this, uh, this ability comes with the cost, of course. It uh, makes it so that he's kind of unable to communicate effectively with others uh, because his mind is so full of you know all these equations that it's difficult to look past them and to relate to people in the real world. Um, and so his mother tries to reach out to him, you know, tries to get him to communicate. Um, and the son also wants to communicate back, but he's largely unable to uh, despite his best efforts. Um, and so our prodigy here begins to wonder why he is the way that he is. Next up, we get to track five, The Teacher's Discovery. And so we then jump to seven years before the events of the lighthouse. And so a gust of wind blows a page of equations off of a teacher's desk and into the hands of the prodigy. So the prodigy immediately goes to work, you know, just working on this, this equation and he easily solves it in just a few minutes. Um, and so the teacher sees this and is completely astounded. You know, this teacher has been working on these equations for years and years. Um, 
to no avail while this young kid just solves it so easily. Um, however, out of jealousy, this rival in the class claims that the prodigy didn't solve it, he did. So that brings us into track six, Love and Envy. So here we have the character of the girl standing up to the character of the rival in defense of the prodigy. So in so doing, the girl kind of reveals uh, her secret feelings for the prodigy. Then we have track seven, Progressive Waves. This is again another instrumental track. Uh, that takes us to The Gift, track eight. Um, and here the teacher pays the prodigy's father a visit. So the teacher just kind of explains to the father how gifted and, you know, genius his son really is. But the father doesn't believe him. The father's always thought of his son as just being completely mentally handicapped due to his inability to communicate effectively. But the teacher, you know, argues with the father telling him, you must give your son a chance to prove his genius. He is brilliant. You just need to give him the opportunity to prove himself. And so the father grudgingly agrees. Sorry, I'm just shooting this video and I'm looking at my hair and it just looks really bad. So sorry if I'm like distracted by my awful hair. Uh, we then get to track nine, the 11th dimension, again, another instrumental track. Um, and this uh, kind of transitions us in time to track 10, Inertia, which takes place five years before the events of the lighthouse. And so the prodigy is trying to reach out to his father. You know, he, he desperately wants to prove himself, but he's still unsure of how to go about it. And he's still un unable to kind of see past the veil of equations that kind of overwhelm him. Track 11, The Theory of Everything, Part 2. So the mother wants the prodigy to go into therapy. She thinks that this will help him be able to function in the outside world and it might be able to get him to communicate. Um, and the father agrees to the therapy sessions, but his motivations are pretty selfish in that he only agrees to them because he hopes that if his son can function the way he wants him to, then maybe his son, because he's brilliant, can help him solve the theory of everything. That then takes us to phase two. This is, um, in my version of the album, this is track two on the album, but this is really just the second section of disc one. Um, anyway, this is phase two, Symmetry, and then we get to track 12, The Consultation. So we have the prodigy meeting with his therapist for the first time. And so the therapist asks the prodigy a series of questions. All the while, uh, the mother is kind of on the sidelines, just desperately pleading with the therapist for answers to help her son. And next we have track 13, diagnosis. Here the therapist reaches a diagnosis. The boy is a complete genius, that's pretty obvious. His mind is unlike any other she's ever met. Um, but because he lives so much inside his head, he has difficulty interacting. And so the therapist explains that he is testing a new drug that might help him. The father, impatient to get his son fixed um, so that he can help him with the theory of everything, uh, jumps all over this idea of, you know, just fixing him with a drug. However, the mother is completely against the drug idea because, you know, there could be a lot of detrimental side effects that the therapist warns of. Track 14, argument one. So the mother and father kind of argue over this drug option and, and the mother kind of outs the father for having selfish motivations for, you know, wanting him to go on this drug, which is, you know, definitely true. Track 15, The Rival's Dilemma. Uh, here we uh, go to the rival who is in fact very smart. Um, however, his intelligence just pales in comparison to the prodigy. And he feels eclipsed by the prodigy. He, he, you know, he longs to feel like special and, you know, be the center of attention. Um, and so because the prodigy has, you know, kind of stolen the spotlight from him, he declares the prodigy to be his enemy. Track 16, Surface Tension. This is again another instrumental track, uh, which takes us into track 17, A Reason to Live. So here the teacher and the girl kind of see the prodigy really struggling with things um, and having a hard time. So together they sort of devise a way to give him a reason to live. Um, and so in the next track we kind of see their separate motivations for wanting to do this. Um, track 18, Potential. So the teacher wants to help the prodigy because he sees it as his, you know, like contribution to the world. Like, you know, he himself can't accomplish the genius that he wants to, but if he could help this prodigy break through and be able to accomplish the things that he knows his beautiful mind can, then that will be his contribution to the world. And he just wants, you know, he just wants good things for him. Meanwhile, the girl wants to help the prodigy because she is secretly in love with him. And there is this still a fucking fly in here. Ah. Track 19, Quantum Chaos. Uh, this again is another instrumental track and I think this kind of represents the, the Prodigy's world, sort of just chaotic, but also beautiful at the same time. Track 20, Dark Medicine. Here the father in secret returns to the therapist and obtains the drug to give to his son. Uh, which then brings us to track 21, Alive. 
Uh, the prodigy here, after ingesting the drug that the father has secretly sprinkled in his food, uh, begins to wake up to the world. He is finally able to make sense of all the things around him, and he kind of like emerges from his cocoon of solitude. So the father is pretty stoked about this, of course, and he immediately asks his son for help with the equation for the theory of everything. Track 22, prediction. The mother is overjoyed by, you know, these new developments within her son. Um, though she still doesn't know about the drug, she thinks that he's just miraculously made a huge turnaround. She's just really happy with this breakthrough in communication that he's been able to accomplish. So that is half of the album. I will be covering the other half in another video. Just kidding, I'll do it now. Sorry if I'm being extra weird today, I'm working on little sleep here, guys. Very little sleep. This is phase three, Entanglement. This is uh, CD number two, if you bought this in CD form. Um, anyway, this is the second half of the concept album. We have an instrumental intro with track one, Fluctuations, that then takes us into track two, Transformation. Um, and so the prodigy kind of needs help navigating this you know, new world that he's woken up to. Um, everything's new to him, he's experiencing everything for the first time, and he just needs a little bit help. And so the teacher steps in to kind of guide him through, through this process. Um, however, uh, the teacher is a little bit apprehensive about how the prodigy has suddenly changed overnight. He feels like this can't be, you know, a natural occurrence, that something must have stepped in to make this happen, which he, of course, is right. Um, that takes us to track three, Collision. And so the prodigy is now able to um, confront his rival for the first time. So the prodigy tells the rival how he, you know, sees that the, the rival has been bullying him this whole time because he is jealous of his genius. And the rival just kind of responds by proclaiming claiming that, you know, he is still convinced that he will one day uh, outshine the prodigy with his smarts. And so the rivalry continues, um, but our prodigy is finally standing up for himself. Here we have another jump in time. We now go to three years before the events of the lighthouse. And so the therapist comes to the father with this alarming news that he has discovered that the uh, drugs that he's been using for his son have awful, awful side effects, um, including delusions and psychosis. And so um, the therapist warns that they must get the prodigy off of the drugs immediately, and he, the father must tell the son what he's been doing this whole time. And so, uh, the father finally agrees, he takes the son off of the drugs, and he um, reveals that he's been secretly giving them to the prodigy um, this whole time. And so the prodigy, of course, is completely outraged um, at the deception, and he ends up running away from home. That takes us to track five, Frequency Modulation, which is an instrumental track, and I think is meant to represent the uh, prodigy dealing with all these dealing with this news and kind of working through his feelings. Track six, magnetism. The prodigy, after running away from home, goes to seek out the teacher, but he ends up running into the girl along the way. Uh, the prodigy tells the girl, you know, what his father's done and asks if he can stay with her for a little while. And the girl wants to agree. However, right at that time, the arrival who has overheard the conversation steps in and, you know, tells the girl that the prodigy is making all this up in order to try and get with her. The girl, of course, is pretty smart, though, so she kind of ignores the rival um, and goes on to try and help the prodigy in any way that she can. Track 7, Quid Pro Quo. Um, so here the prodigy is really fearful of what his life is going to be like without the drug. You know, he knows that without it, he's probably going to revert back to the way he was before, unable to communicate and unable to kind of see past all these crazy equations going on inside his head. Um, and be kind of alone and locked in solitude within his own mind. Um, you know, he's been living in this real world that he's woken up to for years now, and he's just terrified of reverting back to his old ways. And so the rival, being a skilled chemist, offers to duplicate the drug for him. Um, and the prodigy is like, oh, okay, this kind of solves all my problems. Um, he's on board with this, but he knows that the rival isn't doing this for free, so he asks what the rival wants in return. And the rival explains that all he needs is a little help from the prodigy in um, hacking the computer system for this bank so that he can steal millions of dollars. And so the girl, you know, hearing this is completely shocked by this devious scheme, and she tells the prodigy that if he decides to do this, he will have to leave her behind. So it's kind of a, uh, an ultimatum. Either he chooses the girl and the right thing and to kind of revert back into his old ways, or he cho chooses the rival and the drug um, and to do this bank heist. 
That takes us to track eight, string theory, which is an instrumental section, um, which I think is just the prodigy contemplating both options and trying to reach a decision. So we get to track nine, fortune, question uh, mark. The prodigy, desperate to remain, you know, in the current world that he lives in, eventually agrees to the rival's terms and hacks into the bank. Um, so they, you know, successfully steal millions of dollars and they kind of split the, the spoils. However, the girl, you know, feeling betrayed and enraged by what the prodigy has done, uh, you know, being that she told him it was, you know, either the bank heist or her. So he chose the bank heist. And so now she's um, delivering on her promise to leave him. She's very upset. She tells the prodigy she wants nothing to do with him and, you know, wants him to get out of her life. Um, and so here the prodigy kind of begins to regret his decision. And we now get into part four or phase four unification. And this is the final section in this concept album. So this starts off with track 10, Mirror of Dreams. So this jumps to three months before the events of the lighthouse. Um, so the prodigy has been missing for a few years now and the girl uh, eventually goes to the mother, you know, and kind of confides in her about how she's feeling super guilty for leaving the prodigy. You know, no one can find where he's gone and everyone's worried about him. And the girl feels like he never would have disappeared if she hadn't left him. The mother also feels similarly, you know, she feels like uh, she could have done more to help her son. Um, and so together the two just kind of confide in each other. All they can do now is hope that the prodigy has found his way without them. Track 11, Lighthouse. So here we find out um, the prodigy has sought out the teacher for help um, and all the prodigy has left to him, you know, after he's ran away from home and after the girl has left him. All he has left is the theory of everything and he desperately wants to solve it in order to prove it to himself, his father, and the world. Um, so the teacher uh, helps him out, you know, uh, he finds this lighthouse kind of secluded off the grid where no one's going to bother him. You know, this is kind of fortress of solitude where the prodigy can work on the theory of everything, um, you know, without any distractions and in peace. And so the prodigy uses the portion of money that he got in the big heist to purchase the lighthouse. Um, and the teacher is the only one who knows where he is and the teacher goes to check in on him regularly. Track 12, argument two, mother and father argue once again. The father wants to seek out the son and bring him back home. Um, of course, so does the mother, but the mother says that she knows that the father only wants to seek out her son for selfish reasons. His selfish reasons being that he only wants the son back in his life to help him solve the theory of everything. She also blames the father for being the reason that their son left in the first place. Next up, track 13, The Parting. Um, so this is the day before the event at the lighthouse. And so, um, you know, four months after the argument that they had, the mother finally leaves the father. And so this is kind of a wake up call for the father. He, he realizes that he's kind of driven everyone he loves away with his pursuit of the theory of everything. And so in his desperation, he's really only left with one option. Track 14, The Visitation. So that night, the father finally finds a way to track down the prodigy. He goes to see him and, you know, begs for his forgiveness and, and um, asks if they can work on the theory of everything together. Um, so the prodigy is completely exhausted by working day and night with no breaks on this stupid theory. Um, he feels like he's like this close to a breakthrough. And so he eventually agrees to let the father help him, being that, you know, if they have two minds working on it at the same time, they might be able to solve it that very night. And so they begin working, working, working long into the night. Um, they're so, so close. And the prodigy considers taking another dose of his drug because it helps him see more clearly. Um, and so the father's like, yeah, go ahead, do it. Um, you know, we're, we're really close. Just do, do whatever it takes, do whatever it takes. And so the prodigy takes another dose of his drug and um, together they begin working, working, working long into the night until eventually we get to track 15, Breakthrough. And so the pair have worked tirelessly on this theory. And finally, finally they reach a breakthrough and they find an answer to the theory of everything. Track 16, the note. So completely exhausted and very near passing out, the prodigy scribbles a note to the teacher telling him, you know, he and his father solved the theory of everything together. However, this has come at the cost of his sanity, being that he accidentally took too much of his drug in order to reach the answer that now he feels himself drifting away from this overdose. Track 17, the uncertainty principle. So this is the morning of the discovery at the lighthouse from track one. Um, so the teacher arrives at the lighthouse for his daily check-in on the prodigy. However, he is shocked to find the prodigy slumped over in the corner, completely unresponsive. 
So he calls the girl and she rushes over in tears after just getting off a phone call. Um, they find the note in the prodigy's hand and the teacher reads it. It reveals that the father is the only one with the answer to the theory of everything. However, the father is nowhere to be found. The girl tells the teacher that it's impossible for the father to have been working on the theory of everything with the prodigy last night because she just got off the phone with the mother and the father ended up killing himself in their home last night. So that takes us to track 18, Dark Energy, which is an instrumental track where we kind of sort out what the heck this means. And in track 19, Theory of Everything, part three, um, this is 9.46 in the morning. This is, you know, like after the teacher and girl have found the, the prodigy slumped over in the corner, um, the mother arrives at the lighthouse and she's totally devastated by the condition her son is in. She's also really devastated by her husband's suicide, so she's just a total mess. Um, and so the mother and the girl um, just kind of confide in each other once again and they feel that maybe the world was just not ready for the theory of everything as, you know, the pursuit of it has destroyed the lives of both the father and the son. That takes us to our 20th and final track, Blackboard Reprise. And so this brings us to present time. Um, you know, everyone has left the lighthouse except for the teacher who, you know, stands there examining the blackboard, trying to figure out what all happened that night. Um, you know, he knows that the father wasn't actually there because, you know, he killed himself and was nowhere near the lighthouse that night. However, he's looking at the blackboard, trying to discern all these equations, and he notices something strange. Um, you know, the blackboard with all its equations are written in two different handwritings. Um, so yeah, that kind of just leaves us with the question of what the heck does this mean? Uh, you know, it could mean that, you know, maybe the ghost of, of the father was there to help the prodigy try and solve this and was, you know, writing in, in his own hand. Or it could mean that the prodigy just kind of lost his mind completely and had some kind of disassociative thing going on where he was acting as the father writing in his handwriting. Um, yeah, could mean a lot of things. So we're just kind of left wondering. I like that it's left uh, open-ended like that. And I'd love to hear all of your theories down in the description. Me personally, I'm a fan of the uh, kind of disassociative identity disorder um, with this mental break that the son experiences due to an overdose of his drug. I'd like to think that he becomes his father sort of in this very like Norman Bates creepy kind of way. I'm also a big fan of the movie Split as well. So I kind of imagine, I like to imagine him, you know, playing the part as his father. But um, yeah, there's lots of ways you can interpret it. Uh, let me know in the comments. Sorry if you were expecting this uh, concept to be another space opera. This one was more Earth-based, of course, but I, I like it a lot. And it, it is a part of the Aryan universe, even though we didn't go to space this time. Um, anyway, I will uh, come back to the Aryan universe here soon um, with the next few albums, which are some of my favorites. I think Aryan just gets better and better with each album. And I feel like this era, this uh, starting with the theory of everything is where Aryan uh, musically reaches like their like epic era. This gets bigger and bigger and just more awesome and, and dynamic. So big fan of this album. Let me know uh, what your favorite part of this album is down in the comments. Me personally, I love phase four, uh, the whole 20 minute section. I can't pick just, you know, like one track off of it. Um, and plus for, for my version, it's, it's a one 20 minute long track. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. I have covered all the other Aryan albums. I will put a link up here somewhere to the playlist of the other Aryan albums that I explain if you're interested. And if you haven't watched them yet, get caught up up there. Also in other news, um, like I mentioned in the beginning of this video, my debut dark fantasy novel is coming out this November. Release date is set for November 14th. Um, I will keep you guys updated on that. But yeah, if you want to join my street team, um, you'll get a digital advanced reader copy um, of the book. And uh, yeah, details on that I'll put down in the description. Also, if you want to support what I do here on this channel, make sure you like, share, subscribe. Um, and also feel free to join my Metalhead community. Link is down in the description. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. Um, and until next time.